Hello and welcome to this new podcast of the American Journal of Public Health. This new interview is part of our series, What is Public Health?, in which we interview people who played a, have a specific role in public health, try to explain what was their life, what their activity, their importance, and then have them reflect about the consequences of what's going on now in the United States on uh, the efficacy of their uh, activity. So I'm here with my great co-host and good friend, Vicky Maid. Hey, Vicky. And uh, our guest today is Professor Craig Spencer. Craig is an associate professor at Brown University. Uh, he has a large experience in international health in Africa and, uh, and in Asia. He's been with uh, Doctors Without Borders. And he has a kind of uh, uh, unwanted uh, uh, fame because he got Ebola uh, during his activity in Africa. And as you can see, he survived. And that is also part of his own uh, experience. So Craig, welcome. Thank you for being here. Let me jump into my first question. How, what it is to be an American performing international work, global work in Africa or in Asia or in other continents? Well, what's the daily life? Thank you so much for having me, Alfredo and Vicky. I'm so excited to share. I mean, obviously, I'm so passionate about everything in public health and particularly in global public health. I teach on this. I work on this. I write on this. I think on this. And I know that it's so incredibly important, as I know you do as well. Um, what is a normal day like? Well, obviously, you know, global health is as varied as the practitioners that are doing this all over the world, including here in our own country in the U.S. For my own self, my background is mostly in global health, particularly in humanitarian response. So looking at public health and where crises overlap. So think about disease outbreaks, sure, Ebola, hepatitis E, some of the other diseases that I've responded to from a health and humanitarian perspective, but also things like what happens to health systems and public health in the middle of a civil conflict? Uh, how do you manage um, patients in public health when a lot of that infrastructure has broken down in the aftermath of hurricanes or earthquakes? And so what has defined you know, the last decade plus of my career is finding the places where those normal services are either not present or have broken down. And where can I support a team of people going in to try and address those, to try to think about how we set up a trauma referral system in a place like Burundi during the middle of a civil conflict? What are the public health challenges to responding to Ebola in Guinea, Liberia, in Sierra Leone? And how do we need to consider not just the biomedical perspective, but the sociocultural perspective as well? And for me, it has been remarkably rewarding, but it's also been very revealing. And I've recognized that to be very good at this, we need to recognize our history, something that I know, Alfredo, you uh, love to write about and think about, um, have a whole book on. But we need to do a better job, I think, in global health and public health of recognizing how that history continues to play a role today. And I think there's no aspect of public health where that's probably more true than in global health. I was going to say, I guess one of the things is, how do you manage that kind of portfolio? You come in, you need to be a keen insight into culture. You need to know how to set up a system. That's a lot. Can you talk a little bit about how you're able to do that and what prepares you to be able to do that? That's a wonderful question. So I have training as an emergency physician, but a lot of the times the work that I'm doing is not putting people back together. It's really just doing the public health work, doing the epidemiology. I worked as an epidemiologist for Guinea, particularly in the capital Conakry in the 2014 to 2016 West Africa Ebola uh, outbreak. I was able to do one part, but I was part of a much bigger team, including some of our Guinean staff who were incredible. Some of the best providers and epidemiologists and disease detectives I ever worked with were the people I worked with in Gekadu in Guinea, in the Ebola Treatment Center, or in Conakry, the capital, to try to find out what was happening with Ebola on a daily basis. The other thing is that 
you don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be a nurse. You don't need even to be an epidemiologist to do really impactful global health work. Some of the best people that I work with on a daily basis are logisticians. So for me, if you were to ask me, how am I going to get this Ebola vaccine up the river in Congo and we need to keep it at negative, you know, 60 degrees or whatever it is, that's not my background. So for me to do that vaccination campaign, I need everything. I need the community buy-in. I need to work with local government and religious officials and, and the community stakeholders. And then I need to have really smart people that know how to move 10,000 doses of a vaccine up a river while keeping it, you know, sub-zero temperatures. And there are people that do that so wonderfully, so flawlessly. None of what I can do can be done vertically all by myself. Good global health work requires a team, and that team requires, sure, providers, maybe healthcare providers, epidemiologists, the people that do bread and butter public health. But that's not enough. We need so much else outside of that. And when we talk about public health, we talk about how everything is public health. Um, we need everyone in a lot of these outbreaks or in a lot of these conflicts to contribute to make sure that the response we can put together is the most impactful as possible. And just to, to uh, clarify, Craig, part, this was part of uh, U.S. funded operations, right? If there were no U.S. funding behind, you wouldn't have been able to do what you were doing. This is a really good question. So thankfully, I've been able to work with a whole host of organizations over the past 15 years. Save the Children, IRC, other humanitarian health groups. I've also worked with Doctors Without Borders that doesn't take any um, U.S. funding, but does rely on a lot of the other infrastructure and other humanitarian organizations that rely quite heavily on U.S. funding. And we've seen over the past couple of weeks, organizations like IRC, like Save the Children, that may rely on the U.S. and USAID funding for 20 to 40 percent of their budgets have been thrown into chaos, have had to stop programs and have to lay people off. The U.S., particularly through USAID, has done so much over the past few decades to build up healthcare systems and public health systems all around the world with the goal not just of helping them prepare for and respond to outbreaks or improve bread and butter public health activities in Rwanda, Burundi, you know, uh, Indonesia, wherever it may be. But in doing that and strengthening those systems, you end up protecting people here in the U.S. as well. And so a lot of these programs, I, I, you know, I, I always give the example of Rwanda, which just a few months ago had an outbreak of Marburg virus disease, which is very, very similar in all, for all intents and purposes as Ebola. It kills a lot of people. You definitely don't want it. Um, Rwanda had never seen an outbreak of Marburg. Three decades ago, in the aftermath of the genocide, Rwanda started building a really strong public health system. With U.S. support and with international support, it was able to build a very resilient health system, including very strong public health work. Throughout the COVID pandemic, they were an exemplar in thinking about how to reach communities where they were at and to get them vaccinated. And the result was that when Marburg hit at the end of 2024, they were prepared. No, they didn't have, you know, the best, highest quality intensive care doctors in the world. And maybe they didn't have a vaccine manufacturing plant as of yet uh, making the vaccines needed. But they were able to rely on the work that had been done over decades. They were able to rely on relationships with partners like the U.S. government, which promptly sent CDC experts that promptly helped reach out to the Sabin Institute to get investigational vaccines and treatments that the public health authorities in Rwanda were able to swiftly get out to the practitioners and get them vaccinated and get them treated. It was such a remarkable show of force and shows what can be achieved by a lot of countries that was done in Rwanda by Rwandans with a long history of external support. So I think it just goes to show that the U.S. plays a huge role and any abdication of the U.S.'s role in leadership and global health is going to be problematic, not just for the rest of the world, but for us here at home as well. Can you talk about kind of how it reverberates back to us? I mean, I heard examples of, for example, farmers here are being paid to grow food to send to some of these places. So when we stopped it, we were actually hurting our own farmers. Can you give some more examples of, you know, how this you know, in the long run impacts us as well? 
Absolutely. What you said is exactly true. You know, so much of the support and the funding, particularly that U.S., often through USAID, gives out is for farmers. It is for pharmaceutical companies that help make the HIV medications that have saved 25 million lives as part of the PEPFAR program over the past 20 plus years. It helps support organizations like ones I just mentioned, a lot of the humanitarian health organizations that rely on this funding for a big part of their work and without it are not going to be able to respond to humanitarian or health crises all around the world. There's that aspect of that in terms of like the direct financial hit to U.S. individuals and organizations. This also means that in places like Uganda, for example, where friends of mine work for the ministry, you know, up until now, they may have been paid partly or fully through grants from the CDC. And so now that there's an Ebola outbreak in Uganda, you have people that are either working for less pay or working without pay to try to respond to this outbreak because that normal funding stream isn't there. And I think people will show up. They'll continue to do this work. But the sustainability of this system is in question. Even if Uganda was able to respond to this Ebola outbreak now, if we cut off future funding and we can't support those people at the ministry, if we don't send the people from the CDC or we're not supporting the World Health Organization financially I and mean, philosophically as we have for the past, you know, 70, 80 years, then eventually these resources are going to dry up and we're going to lose all of those structures and programs we've built up over a long period of time. So there's that immediate impact of farmers here in the, you know, our own country that are losing out on contracts where that food aid would have gone to places like Sudan, which is in the middle of a famine, where that food assistance would have helped millions and millions of people around the world, but unfortunately is now reportedly sitting and rotting in ports up to around $500 million of USAID food aid that was supposed to go out and was not distributed. Eventually, when those streams are cut off, it's going to impact people here creating that food. It's going to impact companies and organizations here creating those pharmaceuticals and distributing them. It's going to impact the organizations responsible for assessing and responding to disease threats internationally. And that's all going to have implications for us here domestically. Absolutely. So great. Let me ask a final question. I imagine uh, you were in Africa, you know, uh, working on uh, to, to contain the Ebola epidemic, et cetera. And all of a sudden, what's happening today, it was happening then, you know, that uh, USAID was uh, closed and uh, there was no more support from the U.S. to all this global work. What would you have felt if you were in Africa at yeah. that moment? You know, I think that's a really important question, Alfredo. And I can answer it as myself or I can answer it, try to put myself in the shoes of the 20 million people, including 500,000 children, who right now, up until recently, have been reliant on USAID and PEPFAR for their HIV medications. And the way that I've been trying to think about it is imagine that every day, maybe for the past year, the past 10 years, um, you have gone to the local clinic that is supported and has been supported by USAID. That is where you get your treatment. That is which you get your medications and treatments for HIV. When you go there, you see the American flag with the words from the American people emblazoned on it. You sit in a clinic and maybe you sit on a stretcher when you're being seen by the provider that has, again, the American flag and from the American people on it. And then overnight, for reasons that you can't understand, that support is no longer there. You go to the clinic and you look at this person who says, yeah, I know I've been giving you medications for a long time and I know that they're right there on the shelf behind me, but unfortunately I can't give them to you anymore because the decision was to cut costs in Washington, D.C. The decision was to end an organization like USAID for purported wasteful spending, despite the fact that it is around 1% of what we spend on foreign aid, a part of our national budget, you know, a small peanuts in comparison to what we spend on defense, for example, 120th. And as we spend less on things like USAID, we're going to have to spend more on things like defense because we know that this really strong and important global health work is also national security work. It strengthens nations. PEPFAR has made countries stronger, um, has also made people 
live a lot longer and healthier lives, which is important. So if I were that person going to that clinic that just days before I had seen the American flag and from the American people and had been grateful that that assistance was there for me. And then I came back and was told that that was no longer there. The building doesn't exist and the American flag had been taken down and that you need to find some routes to get your medication. I can imagine that people feel really hurt, very sad, confused, concerned about what comes next and betrayed. And I think what's happening right now is that we're seeing an incredible legacy of really strong U.S. support for global health that is being ta being hobbled and torn apart in just a matter of days. And what I've said over and over and over again is that I promise we will regret this. It may be tomorrow, it may be next week, it may be next month, it may be next year. But I promise, as someone who has done this for a long time, we will regret this. Ray, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for all the work you've done and you're doing for public health. Uh, we're all very grateful for this. And thank you for your time and for being with us in this uh, podcast. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Vicky. And thanks for highlighting the incredible work that so many public health people are doing all around the country and all around the world. Um, we need us more now than we ever have. And so thank you. Mm -hmm.